Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Austin Etzler. I'm the project manager for MOVE Engineering, as well as the lead water resources engineer. And I'm here with the rest of MOVE Engineering. Megan, who is the lead structural engineer. Henry, who is the lead geotechnical engineer. And Christine, who is the lead environmental engineer, as well as Khaled's not here in attendance, but he'll appear later on, um, who is the lead transportation engineer. And we're here to provide you guys with the uh, design for the Acton Lake Dam and Spillway renovation. So just a basic project location where the project's taking place. It's in southwest Ohio. Uh, it's in a state park. The, the map kind of shows the lake. It's centraled in, centralized in the park. It, we're just on the south end of the lake is where most of our projects are taking place. <coughs> so this just shows everything that's going on. There's a lot of, it's a pretty busy project, so we just kind of wanted to lay out everything. We start up at the top with the weir. Um, that's part of the structural aspects, as well as the retaining wall. And then we move down the spillway to the fish passage right here, as well as the step channel. That's part of the environmental aspect. And then the primary uh, pipe operating structure and the drainage system right here, that's the water resources aspect of the project. The earth dam is the geotechnical aspect. And then the uh, transportation aspects are the new parking lot, the roadways, and the intersections right here. So in term of the terms of the water resources scope, I was tasked with two objectives. The first being to remove and replace the existing uh, primary drainage structure and also to uh, design a sluice gate system that would allow the lake to be lowered at any given time. This is just a picture of uh, the, the operation structure that, was, that is currently existing. Uh, you can tell that it looks pretty, pretty hazardous to access during a high water event such as this. The spillway is just to the side of that picture, so um, the only way they currently have to access that structure is by boat, which clearly is not a good idea to do at this situation. Uh, this just kind of gives you a brief overview of everything that's going to be going on in terms of the primary drainage structure, um, the renovations that I'll be doing. Uh, it starts with phase one, which is removing the existing operation structure. Uh, then that will be placed 15 feet uh, to the lake side of the retaining wall. Um, that, that'll allow us to install a 15-foot walkway so that uh, structure will be able to be accessed during any uh, water level. Um, then the entire piping will be uh, slip line, which we'll get into here on the next slide. So for the slip lining procedure, this is the way that we're going to be replacing the piping that's there. It's currently a six foot diameter concrete pipe um, that, is, that is corroded. And uh, basically the way this, this works is the HDPE, HDPE piping, which is basically plastic pipe, uh, it's steel reinforced. It gets put into place of the existing concrete piping and the void that's there, there's about an inch void uh, that is filled with grout. Um, this just kind of shows a close up so you can see the steel reinforcement and then this is just basically what it looks like in practice. <coughs> um, also, the other part of that was designing the sluice gate system. So this is the basic drawing of the sluice gate system. Um, these are all the critical elevations for the system. The, the most important one is this uh, 880 foot elevation. That's the top of the platform which is level with the top of the dam. So basically when we install that walkway, you'll be able to access the operation structure basically until there, there would be a catastrophic failure, which won't happen. Um, one other thing to note is that uh, the original operation structure had one sluice gate. We added another sluice gate to add redundancy to our design. That way if one of them would fail, we'd still be able to drain water if need be. Um, and Christine will get into it later on, but this sluice gate actually allows us to uh, get more oxygen into our discharge uh, water. And um, it's important to note that this operation structure isn't made to uh, release water in flood events. That's what the weir does, which Megan will get into later on as well. <coughs> this just kind of shows a view looking down on the um, operation structure. This is just the walkway that goes from the retaining wall. Uh, these are the lifting mechanism mechanisms. Uh, there's slated grate. Um, so you can look down and see the system operating. And uh, the valves are mechanically actuated, and that allows us to operate the valves from a remote location, basically um, the operator's offices. And it also the walkway also allows us to access this these uh, assets if there would happen to be a failure with the mechanical actuator. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Megan to talk about the structural scope. 
Thanks, Austin. Um, so over here you can see kind of a rendering of the structural aspects of the design, and I'll just tell you why they are important. So like Austin said, you have the drainage structure right here, and that's working all the time. But if you have a flooding event, then you need to let more water get to the downstream waters, and that's why we have this weir here. It's basically a large concrete wall that the water flows over if you have a higher lake elevation than you want. So what we did in this project um, is we made sure that that weir is going to stay intact. And we got that information from the Ohio DNR report that they gave us saying that it needed a little bit of repair. And then the retaining wall over here prevents the water that's flowing quickly over the weir from eroding away this earth dam behind it. So that's important as well. And the current one that was there before we started the project needed to be completely replaced. So that's the other part of my design. One difficulty that we have for this is that we are constructing near the water, and that's difficult. So in order to account for that, um, the first step of our construction process is to build this coffer dam system, which gives us dry land that we can use for the construction equipment and the workers to build it. And then the second step would be once you have the section, which is right here. So um, after the coffer dam is built, that area in the box would be pumped out and it would be dry. And then we'd be able to excavate the soil around our dam and that, or around the retaining wall, which is right here. And then we could remove the retaining wall and we could replace it with the new one that I designed. So this is the design of the retaining wall. On the top, you can see a rendering. So it looks like it's one solid wall. But actually, as you can see from the picture below, it's designed in four different cross sections. And that helps us because at different points along the wall, we have different forces. So not every part of the wall needs to be designed, designed as strong as other parts. So that's why we have different cross sections and different depths to account for that. Um, another thing that we had to take into account while designing the wall is that we used the maximum flood event that could possibly happen, which is known as probable maximum precipitation. So this gives us a really high water level, as you can see over here. And that, um, that gives us a very high force on our wall and tries to push it away into the earth dam. So that is why we have this very long footing underneath it. And this would all be underground, underground but it gives us friction so that the wall doesn't slide away. And then we also made sure that the wall um, wouldn't break or tip over. And so we made the concrete two feet thick, which is a pretty thick wall. But because we designed for the maximum possible event, we know that it's very safe. And then the weir, uh, like I talked about before, is what the water flows over in flooding events. And when it was built, it was constructed in the 1950s, and it was built in multiple sections because it was so large. And what the DNR told us they're having problems with is that between those sections, the concrete's starting to spall, which means it's um, rubbing off on the surface. And what we don't want to happen is the reinforcement, which is metal underneath, can get wet, and that starts to corrode. And that really um, gives us less strength in the weir. So we did a pretty um, quick, easy fix for that by just patching things up. And this can be done underwater. So this picture shows much bigger cracks than we'd have in ours. Ours would just be a little bit of surface repair, but you still could have somebody go underwater and apply um, waterproofing concrete patch to it so that you can protect that metal underneath from getting wet. And there's a rendering about how it all fits together. So now Christine can talk to you about the environmental things that she designed. Thank you, Megan. Hello, everybody. Special hello to people tuning into the live stream. My name is Christine, and I am the environmental engineer for Move Engineering. My part of the design had two main goals. The first was to design a fish passage, which will connect Acton Lake with the downstream waters of Four Mile Creek. And the second goal that I had was to increase the dissolved oxygen levels of discharged water to an EPA minimum of six milligrams per liter. So first I want to talk about the fish passage. This is important because anytime you have a dam, you're essentially cutting off the, the access for fish to go from up to downstream during re reproduction cycles. Um, but fortunately, we can design uh, a fish passage. There are many different types, but the kind that I chose to design is called a denal. And the main feature of this is that you have these baffles that run through the entire system. They're angled up from the floor at 45 degrees. What this does is help regulate the flow within the system, and it also, the denals have little V-notches, and this provides a profile of different velocities, so fish of varying sizes and uh, swimming strengths can use the system. 
basically, uh, the way that it works is that the fish will enter in and swim upstream against the current. You'll also have resting pools uh, along the system, and then the fish can enter into the next water body. So some basic requirements, we're designing for freshwater fish. Um, so this means that the fish can't jump. So this is why we had to use the DINAL. It's a one connected channel. Um, the channel width has to be a minimum of two and a half feet and the resting pools are provided every 20 to 26 feet. Like I said, we have baffles 45 degrees from the floor and a gentle slope of 15% up. And also it has to be conveniently placed in the context of our entire system. So this is a 3D rendering of what the fish passage looks like. Uh, if this is Acton Lake over here, and if the fish want to leave, they can go over the weir. Um, but then when they come back up, they'll come up the spillway retreat channel, enter the channel right here, and then each 20 feet we have resting pools because if you were swimming upstream for 600 feet, you would get tired as well. Um, <laughs> so they travel up this way and then make a turn and they're right back home in Acton Lake. This is the standard baffle design. Like I mentioned earlier, there's this V-notch here. This helps with the velocity profiles, makes it more accessible for different types of fish. So the second issue, dissolved oxygen. So every liquid has a certain amount of dissolved gases in them. When we're talking about an aquatic environment, oxygen is the most important. Um, the issue at Acton Lake, though, is that um, the water is sourced from the bottom of the lake. And at the bottom depths of the lake, we have really, really low to no dissolved oxygen in the water. Um, this is due to um, algae photosynthesis and decay using up all of that oxygen. So you end up with a dead, dead zone. And this is the water that we're discharging, which can have negative effects on the ecosystems downstream in Four Mile Creek. So what do we do? Um, this, show, this table shows the existing oxygen levels within the lake. This is at one meter, so at the very top of the lake, and this is at eight meters, so the very bottom of the lake. As you can see, really low, less than 1% saturation at the bottom. But if we look over at the top levels, for most of the months of concern, we have super saturated water. So if we can mix these two layers as we're discharging the water, then we can increase the total saturation of dissolved oxygen and meet the EPA requirement. So the aeration system is actually a two-phase system. Uh, first, we have a sluice gate system, which will have that mixing effect. Like Austin mentioned, that we have the two sluice gates, one at the bottom and one at the top. Uh, and then the second part is the stepped channel, which um, helps when we have lake turnover. So if you look back at this table, here in October, we see that all of a sudden we have a really dramatic drop in uh, dissolved oxygen levels. And then at the bottom, we have a really dramatic spike. This is because as the temperatures decrease, the water becomes cooler and thus denser. So you get lake turnover. So everything mixes together. But if we're mixing this, because this is less than six milligrams per liter, we're not gonna reach the requirement. So what do we do? We have a step channel. Um, so what this does is essentially increases the turbulence of the water and helps more oxygen in drain into the water. So here's the sluice gate system, familiar drawing to you. Um, one important thing to note about this is that this is the door to the gate and it opens from top to bottom. That way we're ensuring that the most oxygenated water is always coming through the system. Uh, the structural design is exactly the same, six by six. And then here we have the infamous stepped channel. Um, so it's going to be located right after the outlet structure. It consists of seven steps that are six feet long and three feet tall. Um, because of uh, the dimensions, we get a 56.6% increase in total air concentration, which equates to about one milligram per liter of dissolved oxygen. Um, here's a side view, so if you chopped it in half looking at its side. Uh, the lighter line is the pre-existing spillway surface, so we're just going to demolish this little slice, uh, mold in the seven steps, and then uh, slope it back down. And here's a close-up of the steps, six foot by three. So um, each month we have different oxygen requirements. So we can use that to uh, specify a certain flow that's required to go through this sluice gate. Uh, once we get everything mixed before the steps, each month has 4.45. And then after the steps, that will bump it up all the way to six milligrams per liter. And everybody can breathe. 
now pass it on to Henry for the geotechnical design. Okay, so for the geotechnical aspect of this project, we're mainly concerned with the earth dam itself and whether or not it is stable, how well it's going to hold up with holding back the water. And so we first needed to analyze the conditions of the dam. We needed to check it for a stable slope and check to see how much seepage was going through the bottom of the dam. And then we needed to find out if these were problems, what we would do to solve the problem. We used a software called GeoStudio 2012 to analyze the state of the dam. It is a program that is used for checking the properties of various um, earthen structures, and it can tell you about how they interact with water and their strengths and such. And what we gathered is for the slope was that the it told us that there's this wedge here that if it were to fail, it would tend to slide. And we also were able to find out that the factor of safety on that was high enough that there would not be any risk of that really happening. Um, the, um, so we decided that that wasn't going to be an issue and therefore we worried more about seepage. And this is the image that came from the program from the testing the seepage. And red colors are higher pressures and blue colors are lower water pressures. And so you want bluer colors within the dam. And here you can see that water tends to come out here and you can end up with water on the wrong side of the dam, which is problematic. And therefore we decided that that needed to be fixed. And since it was coming out near the, the toe end right here, we chose a relief well, which is a trench that will run along the entire um, front face of the dam. And it'll be uh, 10 feet deep and four feet wide. And it will be filled with a material such as sand, which has enough air space into it that will al it'll allow um, the water to lose some of the pressure as it enters that space and then it will not have the tendency to rise above the ground surface. Here is a overhead view of it running along the length of the dam. It's quite long. At the end, we have a drainage pipe that will collect um, any water that makes it that far. We don't have a lot of seepage, so it shouldn't be a big problem, but it would then route that into the spillway, which would then go into Four Mile Creek. Here's a 3D rendering of the dam, and as you can see, or you it's hard to see. There's a small brown stripe at the base. And the fact that it's hard to see is actually a good thing because it's really not going to make a big impact on the aesthetics of the dam as it stands. It's going to be there and out of the way, and it will solve our problem. Um, and then we reanalyze the seepage to see will this work if we put it in place. And as you can see, there's a lot more blue colors within the dam, which means that the pressures are a lot lower. It's got a lot less of a tendency to have water run underneath it at a pace that would cause erosion and possibly a failure of the dam. And now the transportation portion of the project with uh, special guests, Khaled.
So with that, we'll uh, finish off with our cost estimate. This just breaks up all of our costs into uh, each discipline. We wanted to make sure we called out our design costs because we want to be paid as well. Uh, and then this is our construction cost based on each discipline. So it finishes off just about $4.23 million. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and your support through this process for all of us. And we'll bring move back up and open the floor to questioning. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so that actually was a really interesting current event that was applicable to us. Um, the We had already pretty much started our design uh, when that happened. Um, and in the actual uh, Acton Lake project, because this is based on a project that did occur, um, they replaced the entire spillway, uh, which we didn't end up doing, but I imagine that that would involve a lot of seepage analysis and that sort of thing on Henry's end of things. 